For at TV, the world is thinking. The um, comic book industry responded to this clampdown by, uh, by taking desperate measures and attempted uh, uh, to, and put into place a system of self regulation. It was really a system of self censorship. And we know that the history of censorship in this country is in large part a history of self censorship and then disguised as self regulation. Uh, the, the, the Hayes Office Code in, in the film industry, for instance. Well, the comic book business and the desperate, uh, desperate attempt to stay in business enacted a code that was based on the Hayes Office Code, down to much of the specific language. I'm going to give you an example of uh, how rigidly this code was informed by another, another brief passage. Uh, okay. Okay. The last comic book that EC published was the February 1956 issue of Incredible Science Fiction issued in November 1955. Al Feldstein, the editor, submitted the pages to Charles F. Murphy. He was a former magistrate who led the Comics Code Authority. So Feldstein, the editor, submitted the pages to Charles F. Murphy late in the summer of 1955. Feldstein said, recalling these events, Murphy always read our stuff himself. I'd go in there with the pages, and the little old ladies, he had a board of people who were reading the comics, and Feldstein disparagingly calls them the little old ladies. The, uh, I'd go in there with the pages, and all the little old ladies were reading everything else, and I'd have to wait until Murphy personally read our pages, end of quote. That issue of Incredible Science Fiction included a story written by a writer named Jack Olek and illustrated by Angelo Torres, who to this day draws for Mad Magazine about mutants. Murphy rejected it outright. You can't have mutants, he said, as Feldstein remembered. <laughs> Feldstein said, so I went back to the office and I said, Bill, what are we gonna do? We, we got a deadline. He said, well, let's pull out an old one, one that we already used before the code, but was clean enough to pass. So I dug out one of my favorite pieces, end of quote. Written late in 1952 and originally published the following spring, the story, called Judgment Day, was one of what Feldstein called his preachies. He had favorite, one of some of his favorite stories were stories that had a, a, a moral point, and he called them his preachies. This one was a science fiction allegory about race. It followed an astronaut from Earth as he inspected a planet populated by self-replicating robots some painted orange and some blue, but identical mechanically. When the Earthmen saw that the orange ones had subjugated the blue ones to poverty and servitude, he declined to welcome the robots into the Galactic Union. The last panel of the story showed the astronaut back in his spaceship with his helmet removed, and we see that he is black-skinned. Feldstein said, in the 1950s when I wrote it, that was a pretty strong message. You know, a message of hope for the future, the audacity of hope. The message of hope for the future of what was then a terribly segregated society, end of quote. Indeed, as a matter of fact, when Judgment Day was first published, the Chicago Defender, the African American newspaper, devoted an editorial to recounting the story, which the newspaper praised for, quote, uh, combining the lore of color and fantasy with educational propaganda, end of quote. Charles F. Murphy read the pages impassively. Feldstein said, he got to the last panel and he looked up at me and he said, no, you can't have a Negro. I said, why not? He said, you can't have a Negro. I said, where in the code does it say I can't depict a Negro? He said, I say you can't have a Negro. I said, that's the point of the whole story. No. So I said, bye. Feldstein returned to the EC office and protested the gains. I said, Bill, this is impossible. It just can't work. They're after our ass, and they're going to find any excuse to give us a hard time. And Bill called up Murphy, and he said, what the hell is going on? And Murphy said, you can't have a Negro. 
And Bill said, okay, I'm going to have a press conference and I'm going to tell the public that the Comic Book Authority is a racist authority that will not permit black people to have equal depiction. After a pause to reflect, Murphy granted Gaines permission to publish the story on the condition that the beads of perspiration on the black's astronaut be removed. Gaines said, fuck you. Hung up on Murphy and published the story intact. That was Bill's last act as a comic book publisher, said Feldstein. He was upset and he had had it and he was broke and he was mad. I don't think Bill Gaines would have published a comic book if, if Frederick Wortham and Estes Kefauver came into his office holding hands and they said, Bill, we want to apologize. We were wrong and you were right. Please come back and give us more horror comics. I think he would have kicked them out on their asses. He had had it. So Gaines uh, shut down his comic book operation and published Mad as a way to kick the asses of the conservative authority for the, for the next 40, 50 years and still doing it today.